Alright, here we go. Hello everyone, welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. We are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. My name is Robert Winfrey, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to join me here on this show. Or to listen to me while you're driving, or while you're bored at work, or you throw me on to let the dulcet tones of my voice soothe your slightly unruly children to bed at night. I know at least one person who's done that. Um, Whatever works for you. I'm just glad you're listening, and I thank you very, very much. Um, I think we have a few new people who showed up recently. Um, Again, profoundly grateful for everyone who takes the time. Many, many thanks. All right, uh, on the agenda this evening, last night, UFC 297, you know what? This is what I get for being quasi-optimistic. I was looking around at some of the other, you know, commentators and punditry and the people who can talk about the MMA space, and a lot of people were more down on UFC 297 than I was. I was not, you know, over the moon, but I was relatively complimentary of it on paper. And, well, turns out I was wrong. Um, this was, man, this was a long night. Long night. So we'll review that. And a little bit of news. Um, the U- <laughs> the Saudis. <laughs> um, I, I, we will talk a little bit about that. Um, the UFC and... Uh, we have to talk a little bit about um, Dana and some reporters, don't we? Not a lot, just a little bit. Um, my stance on this is weird. Well, not weird, but... I don't talk about it a whole lot because... The pointless drama of that surrounds fight promotion and fighters and person like uh, the big stuff I'm happy to talk about the pointless little bits of drama I tend not to it's it's stupid it creates a weird ecosystem and I I don't have time for it I don't want to do it but something came up last week uh, before the event and then afterwards that. I do think bears at least a bit of discussion. So we'll talk about that. Again, we'll, t- we'll laugh at the Saudis, kind of telling the UFC, yeah, the hell you will, in terms of giving us a fight on the card. Um, <laughs> oh, that's still funny. And UFC 300 got a few more fights announced, so we'll keep our watch on that event. We'll talk about that. Um, that's all I've got on paper. So please like, comment, subscribe, star rating, written review, whatever is applicable to your podcast platform of choice. I know you don't like hearing me say it. I don't like saying it. It, yeah. It's weird, but everybody says it for a reason. And I kind of, the fact that I don't like saying that stuff doesn't mean it doesn't generally get something approximating the desired effect. And, yeah, again, however gross I feel about it, it's a grossity related to a combination of um, how these platforms work and a bit of the human psychology. We need to be reminded of things. Uh, everything. Pretty constantly until you actually build a habit. And building habits is a lot harder than people think. Um, usually you do it unconsciously, and then by the time you realize you've done it, oh boy, it's late, and then unlearning them is a whole other can of worms, but... Okay, um, anything else I had here? Nope, I think that's it, so why don't we go ahead and jump on into UFC 297, shall we? Uh, Alright, top of the card, well, top of the discussion, um, I've been doing my, those of you slightly newer here, uh, this year I am tracking my predictions and how I've... Uh, How I do. Uh, Your boy did not have the best night, UFC 297. I went 7 and 6. Is that right? Or 7 and 5. I think it was 7 and 5. I was one off of 50-50. And that's really my big thing. I want to stay above 50-50. Yeah, I was 7 and 5. Um... Did a number on me. I had a good start. Um, but, yeah, not great. Only, I think there's only two of those I felt I should have. So, okay, there's three of them that, this can sound weird. 
there's three that kind of stand out in my mind about, that I got wrong. One, I'm just kind of annoyed at myself because I should have known. I, I should have... I maybe should have got that one right. One was just a split decision that was legitimately very, very close. Could have gone either way. I can't be mad about it. Just have to note it. Third, third, I probably... There's one that I feel like I maybe should have got. And there's one that... that man, that Magni and Malat thing. When we get to it, we'll talk about it. That one, that's bothering me a little bit. Um, a little bit. So, three of those, again, one super close split decision, could have gone the, either way. I, that's one of those you just can't be mad about when, you make, when you're when you making predictions. Like, if you have a close fight and it swings, just, it just happens to not go your way, you can't do anything about that. Can't do anything about that. So, there, yeah, there's that. Um, yeah, the others that I missed, like, I just, I missed. You know, so be it. But yeah, there's there were a couple. There were a couple that uh, I probably should have gotten. But we'll get to all that. So seven and five on the night, uh, fifteen and eight on the year thus far through two events. Yeah, again, not my best performance, but. Hopefully it doesn't get worse than that. It might. I think I said this last week. Like, you know, it had a pretty good start, but I expect that to slip closer to 500. Well, here we are, closer to 500. So. All right, anyway, moving on from that. Main event. Now, you know what? Hang on. Before before I talk about the fight in particular, um, this was a long night. There were... 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... Yeah, there were 12 fights on the card. I, for those of you wondering why I didn't just double-check my pick right there i've found it beneficial why is that that is not an anaconda joke ah oh, god sorry the outcome of the uh, jasmine jasdavisius and priscilla cashway fight is listed as an anaconda choke that's what bruce buffer announced was not an anaconda choke an anaconda choke and a darce choke are two different things that was not an anaconda I don't care what he said. I know the difference between the chokes. So, yell about it later. Um, Twelve fights, and we had a lot of decisions. The first three, pre- the first four prelims all ended inside the distance. Cool. We had uh, what should have been your fight of the night. I'll spoil that. Go the distance. Then Sean Woodson and Charles Jordan went the distance. And okay, then Garrett Armfield and Brad Katona went the distance, and suddenly, oh boy. Then the next two fights on the main card went the distance. So we're, you know, it's starting to get a little late here, fellas. Next fight is a third round TKO, so 15 seconds away from the distance. Then both of our title fights went the distance. This thing started, I'm going to use my time, I live mountain standard, uh, mountain time zone. This thing started for me at 4.30 and ended right around midnight. I usually block out six hours for these things in my head when I do them. It's six hours start to finish. This was closer to seven um, when it was all said and done. So... Uh, and look, man, some of that's outside your control. Twelve fights is a reasonable amount of fights for a card. Two title fights is not... It's not unreasonable. Three, I think, is... That's when you start to really ask for trouble. Two is not unreasonable. You just had one of those nights when it all kind of fell wrong. Um, your main event was your fight of the night. Again, this is crap. Fight of the night should have been Ramon Tavares and Seri, uh, Seri City. That should have been your fight of the night. It wasn't for, I imagine, two reasons. One, Tavares missed weight pretty badly, so he wouldn't have been eligible. They should have given the whole 100K to City. But the other, I think by the time the main event got done, the Dana White in particular, but the UFC brass were just like, thank heavens. 
a fight took place on the main card of this pay-per-view that didn't kind of suck. Now, I disagree with that characterization. I actually thought... Uh, okay, Curtis and Barrio had two pretty poor rounds and then a decent third. Dana crapped all over of Loyev and Allen, and I don't agree with that at all. Um, did Pennington... Okay, so n- w- now we're just going to get into it, so... Main event, Drickus Duplessis defeats Sean Strickland via split decision, 48-47s. So two for DDP, one for Strickland. He is your new middleweight champion. <sighs> Doing this live, I was 4-1 for Duplessis. I rewatched the fifth round in particular, because that's the one that I think I got wrong. Everyone else gave that to Strickland. I didn't doing it live, so hang on, let's... If I'm that far out of line with the general consensus, I go read the card. I go rewatch it because if I can watch it just to watch it instead of having to type and do some of the other, you know, pay attention to other stuff going on around me, covering an event is not, covering a fight is not a good way to score it. Um, I'm not the only one to hold that opinion, and there's a reason that my scores are highly unofficial. I got the fifth round wrong. Having rewatched it, should have gone to Strickland. Not some giant margin, but I think Strickland won that round. So one and five to Strickland, two and four to Duplessis. Those are all pretty unanimous. Uh, they were all unanimous according to the three judges scoring. I think most people scored it the same way. Three is the swing round. And two of the judges, Cage said, gave it to Duplessis. I gave it to Duplessis. I've seen a lot of the vocal mon- people on Twitter go, going, you know, no, Sean should have won. Here's the thing about this. This is the only thing I'm going to say about the decision. Congratulations, you fought a close fight. You fought a close fight. Um, you could go 3-2 to two for either guy and be perfect. Those are perfectly acceptable scorecards. The third round was that close. Um, I know Dana scored it for Strickland. You know, some other people, I think one of my brothers said he thought Strickland was ahead at the end of it, and I, you know, I'm not here to tell anybody they're wrong. If you went 3-2 to two Strickland, cool. We don't have a problem. But, like, there's nothing wrong with it. Not a darn thing. I scored it for Duplessis. Um, this was not an action fight in the traditional sense, but I don't think it was bad. Um, Strickland came out, I forget how big Sean Strickland is sometimes, and he exacerbates it by standing very straight, but, um, yeah, he's just always a little bit surprised by some of his physical dimension. The fact that he used to fight at welterweight throws me off too, because he fought at welterweight before he got into that, uh, motorcycle accident when he messed his knee up. It was not long after he came back from that, but I think it was his first fight after that, that he moved up to middleweight. Um, Strickland comes out doing Sean Strickland things. A lot of jabs, checking leg kicks, deflecting punches. Um, he gets taken down, but gets back up very, very quickly. He doesn't lead to a whole lot. Uh, pretty typical Sean Strickland round. Second round, Duplessis starts adjusting. Duplessis, I'm going to give him a lot of credit here. He He stuck to a pretty good game plan. It struggled a bit at first, but it's one of those things where if you keep doing it, even though it's it, a lot of people when they spar, when they fight, they think, oh, this didn't work, therefore I must not, therefore I have to stop doing it. Frequently, or the opposite, and they overcommit to, no, I'm doing my thing. More on that in a minute or two when we get to the co event. And neither is quite right. You have to have a gauge about, is what I'm doing you know, working. Not huge, because sometimes you face a lot of adversity. He had to deal with checked leg kicks. Sean Strickland very good about checking leg kicks. He had to deal with struggling to reach the target of Sean Strickland's head. Sean very good about deflecting punching lanes. Pretty good about moving. Um, he had a bunch of head kicks blocked. He had some that partially got through, and he had to just persevere through the defense of Strickland initially to get some reads, start timing the jab a little bit, work the body, Find better timing for his leg kicks, usually off of stance switches. Um, Worked some decent body kicks. 
and then slowly start using a lot of those kicks to start getting into to change the range a little bit to where he could start landing to the head. And he started getting there with his right hand, his left hook. He threw spinning back fists, probably too many, but he had a pretty decent read on when Strickland was going to evade into which side, and that's a good weapon for that, straight up. Um, again, his kicks were okay. Some good wrestling from Duplessis. It started fading for him a little bit down the stretch, but he started telegraphing the shots a bit too much. And once Strickland adjusted some of his um, stance and what he was expecting to block the takedowns, especially if they were coming a little bit less set up, he was able to stuff them because he's a pretty good fighter. Um, Strickland came alive and pretty definitively in the fifth. He started throwing his right hand a bit more. Um, looping at the, and he made a good account of himself, and this was not a bad fight. Um, this wasn't, okay, here's the other thing about Duplessis. Because he does not punch in a way that looks mechan like aesthetically pleasing, or is like all that mechanically what you're used to seeing, a lot of what he does gets dismissed, and I think that's a big mistake. Uh, everyone learns the fundamentals. Everyone learns the basics, right? And you teach proper technique. This is what you do for the first year, two years. Sort of depends on how much you're trying to teach somebody. What ath some athletic, like there's some variance here because there's, you know, there's how quick do they pick it up? How much time are they willing to put in? But you spend, you know, a year maybe even two, two and a half wouldn't shock me in some cases, but drilling the fundamentals, how to jab right, how to time your jab, how your footwork works, your, and here's your combination, you know, all that stuff. You do that a lot, and you drill it, and you drill it, and you drill it, and you, you do it until you can do it properly every time. Then you have to figure out, okay, how do I make the fundamental weapons and principles work for me. In American Kenpo, we call this tailoring. We all know the same basics. How do I make these basics line up with the principles at play? How do I make this all work for me? Because I'm a unique individual. I do not fight the same way Sean Strickland does. He does not fight the same way Drickus Duplessis does. He does not fight the same way Frankie Edgar did. does not fight the same way Demetrius Johnson does. We can go up and down here. You have to figure out how to make your, how to make the principles and tools work for you with what you have. And sometimes that's, oh boy, my hips are a little bit screwed up. So my kicks, I need a step. I pretty much, if I'm going to kick high, I kind of have to take a pendulum step. I, I have to do that. Know which leg you kick better with. If you watch Duplessis, his right leg doesn't go high all that often. He'll throw leg kicks with it, but he does not throw the right head kick very often. If he's going body or higher consistently, it's usually the, le it's the left leg. Now, he'll do that out of either orthodox or southpaw, but... That's the side you have to worry about the power kicks coming from. The right side, he doesn't even throw that many body kicks uh, from. Not saying none, just not a lot. So he probably kicks better with his left leg than his right. Everyone has a dominant leg. I really, I, I genuinely resent the people who are like right hand and left leg dominant. Because that means you get to fight with your power leg forward and your power hand in the back. And I, that, that's witchcraft. Stop doing it. I hate you all. Some of us have to be, some of us are mono side, and especially kicking. Uh, but you figure out how to make it work for you, and this results in stuff that you wouldn't teach. You know, look at some of the stuff Adesanya does. Look at some of the stuff Anderson Silva did. You don't, that's not really how you teach someone to strike. I mean, dude, ditto wrestling. Or certain jujitsu stuff. Like, um, there's some stuff that, like, uh, Khabib does. That's not really how you would teach it. It doesn't mean his technique is bad. It means he knows, okay, how do I fight? And what are my physical attributes? One of the other things about Khabib, 
So as an aside to kind of get to my point here, like other guys that fight out of that camp don't fight like he did. He and Islam Makashev do not fight the same. Um, Khabib was a lot more forward pressure, much more aggressive generally. Um, partially because he had a great chin. I never, he never got cut, never got dropped. You could argue there were a couple of times when he might have been a little bit bothered by punches, but dude, he ate some pretty clean, he ate some partially clean shots and a few decent punches from guys who can thump over his career, and it never bothered him. Islam Makashev doesn't fight that way because Islam Makashev's chin is not the same. So, to bring this back around to Drikas Duplessis. Yeah, he's a bit awkward. Um, he looks awkward, the way he fights physically. It, it, it looks weird. But guess what? It works. I don't fight like that. I mean, I don't fight professionally, but you know, I don't spar like that. Uh, I don't spar like Strickland either. But you find what works for you. And this is, this is true in boxing as well. Boxing's a very narrow skill set, which I don't say is a negative. I actually say that as a, a big compliment because every little detail has to be really, really dialed in when you box because everything's so refined. But there's still differences, right? There's still different styles. There's still different tools. There's still different strategies and weapons. And how do you make this stuff work for you? You know, not everyone fights like Muhammad Ali did. Not everyone fights like Joe Frazier did. Not everyone fights like Rocky Marciano or... There's a few technicians I could name. They're like, okay, no, there's a bunch of stuff you should take from these guys. But even the stuff you should take, you still got to figure out how to make it yours. I mean, James Tony, And if you only know fat James Tony from his U- from his one UFC fight of the way past his prime, I, I cannot urge you strongly enough to watch prime James Tony. It's uh, miraculous, almost. His primary defensive tape study was Ezra Charles, but he didn't fight like Ezra Charles. He took the principles and a lot of the technique and then adapted it to how he wanted to fight. That's, that's what you do, because nobody fights like a textbook. So... <sighs> part of the problem is that we have the ideals or we have the what we think should be about how things are done and when you deviate from that you a lot of people point and go bad well there's some stuff that i wish that, that duplicy should still tighten up yeah i mean that sincerely like there's some there's tailoring to yourself and then there's some stuff like okay we clearly got to work on this but as a general rule, he's figured out how to fight like himself. And he's got he's the UFC middleweight champion. He's got good jabs out of both stances. He's strong. He's got good takedowns. Uh, he, had, again, he had timed some really nice ones against Sean Strickland. Sean Strickland is not easy to get down. And he's even harder to hold down, as evidenced here. Uh, he's got that going for him. Yeah, he's a bull. He's got power. Uh, he busted up Strick. He cut up Strickland's left eye. Uh, and he can fight for five rounds. That was one of my big question marks. Was we've not seen him do it. He's been scheduled for it before, but we haven't seen it. And turns out he's a five-round fighter. You know, hey, thumbs up, man. It's a heck of a skill. There's a lot good there. He's only thirty. And there's still stuff to work on with him. I, I certainly am not out here to say he's a, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that we can learn from him in tape study. There's some stuff. There's some stuff that he needs to refine a little bit as well. Like his right overhand is a windmill. And that really, especially down the stretch, it kind of got, it kind of got less and less straight over time. And that's something you need to kind of sort out. Um, there's, what's the other thing about him in this one? I'd like to see some better cage cutting out of him. 
Um, he's a bit too eager to go to spinny stuff when when the fundamentals don't necessarily work the first time, he will go to a spinning back, something a little bit wilder, to try and then go back to the fundamentals because you show someone something they're not expecting, it changes their defensive posture, and then you get back to other stuff. I get why he does it. I think he's just a little quick to pull that particular trigger. It's a bit more obviously a setup for what he wants to do originally than... I'm setting this and setting up the spinning attack, but you know, that's a minor thing. You know, these two fought at a pretty good clip for guys their size. You know, credit to Sean Strickland. Um, you know, down in even on uh, what you know, one guy had it even going into the fifth, and he came out for that fifth and he fought, got his right hand going a little bit, um, started moving forward a bit more. I mentioned one of the things that uh, was going to dictate this to me a bit uh, was who had forward pressure because Strickland in particular off the back foot is not the same guy he is on the front. Um, Duplessis doesn't mind playing for as much of a bull as he is. He doesn't mind reloading and then exploding on occasion. But uh, a fair amount of blood. Duplessis face got a little bit busted up and Strickland got cut up around the left eye. Um, the lack of, here's the other thing about this, I think that hurt Strickland. He didn't do a lot other than headhunt. If you look at his fight with, um, Adesanya, he did a decent amount of body work with front kicks and he actually did some leg kicking, um, to try and shut down Izzy's leg kicks in addition to some of the other stuff he was doing defensively. And... Yeah, that that hurt him here. He did a lot of head hunting, did Strickland. Um, Duplessis a little bit more varied in his attacks. I actually would have preferred to see him do a bit more body work. But, you know, I tend to think that about MMA in general. Just body work's undervalued. Uh, but, yeah, all in all, solid fight. Not an all-time great, but a good fight. A good fight, I would say. Um, in the aftermath, uh, again, there was a... Dana White didn't think that Duplessis won, but, you know. Like I said, it was a close fight. I'm not up in arms over that. Uh, where, the way I have been in the past when he's been fairly vocal about his opinion on who won a fight. Um, Strickland said, you know, he'd like an immediate, he'd like a rematch. I don't think that's my favorite option, but it's definitely viable. Um... There's a few other things that have to shake out at middleweight. So Duplessis, you know, said, I'd like to fight Israel Adesanya, which tracks. They had that interaction after uh, after Duplessis beat Whitaker. And then, you know, went on to, uh, Adesanya went on to lose to Strickland. So some of that's going to depend on, like, when Adesanya wants to come back. What might be available? Adesanya is has been publicly downplaying the possibility of returning at UFC 300. He thinks it's a bit too soon. Um, DDP was pretty banged up. So, um, just in the face, I'm just not sure. Um, no idea what his t- return timetable will be. I don't think he was injured or anything, but uh, we'll have to pay attention to it. The whole thing about, you know, UFC 300 still needing a pretty decent-sized title fight on it. It still holds. We're going to talk about some other fights that got made for that event in a little bit, but nothing that I would say would fill the main event slot. So if Adesanya's not available, if these guys aren't too banged up, it's not impossible, but I don't know. Uh, We're just going to have to wait and see. Um... I do have to mention one of the dumber takes I've seen coming out of this, though. After the fact, you know, because Duplessis is the first South African UFC champion, naturally he got at, Dana got asked, you know, so you're thinking about doing something with that? And he said, yeah, we're looking into doing a show in South Africa. And the number of people who then went, oh, so you had, you had this period of time when you had three Nigerian champions. Well, you had two Nigerians and a Cameroonian champion. 
and you couldn't make UFC Africa happen then, but now that you got a white guy, and I just have to roll my eyes. Like, do you people not understand how this works? I know some of you are just engagement farming on Twitter, but do you really not understand how this works? Any time you get something like this, any time you get a new champion or even an older champion who has a unique geographical position in the world that they're kind of attached to, and they get asked about it, the UFC, Dana White always says, yeah, we're looking into running blah. If this had been like one of the Turkmenistan fighters who were kind of on, like, if they had won the UFC title, then yes, of course, we're looking into running a UFC event in Turkmenistan. Never mind that Dana White couldn't find Turkmenistan if you put a gun to his head. But that's what he'd say. The whole time that you had Adesanya and Usman and um, Nganu as champions, any time he was asked, Dana said, yeah, we're, we're working on it. We're looking into it. Like, that that was the thing. This is what he says. Oh, so George St. Pierre is your champion. Are you going to take him to Montreal? Yeah, we're working on something. You know, Michael Bisping's your champion. You gonna you going to run him in England? Yeah, we're working on something. They did in that case, but... You know, you got you got a Brazilian champion. You going to run him in Brazil? Yeah, we're working on something. Maybe something comes of it. Maybe it doesn't. Remember, they were supposed to be in China a few more times this year. There ain't nothing coming to that. Took him forever to get to Australia. I'm not... There's a lot of people who are doing the... Who are trying to play that card. Like, the UFC wasn't looking into it when they had Adesanya and Nganu and Usman. Of course they looked into it. Of course they looked into it. How feasible was it? Is there a place that had the necessary infrastructure? Are there security concerns? I mean, there's always security concerns with something like a UFC event, but were there serious security concerns? How is this political stability in the region these are serious concerns you know they there have been how many fighters from parts of you know the i mean they took forever to get to russia long history of great russian fighters how long did it take the ufc to run a russian card took them forever to get into france some of that was the french government but you just you kind of see it like they've run maybe two or three in germany they have any great German fighters at the moment, but that's kind of a centralized location for a bunch of European fighters. And it just, look, if something comes of it, it comes of it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Are they looking into running a South African event now that they've got a South African champion? I'm sure they are. I'm sure they're looking at venues. I'm sure they're looking at how it would affect start times around the world. I'm sure they're looking into all the stuff that is necessary to run a UFC event. They're going to check. Maybe something comes of it. Maybe it doesn't. But if you're trying to, again, like the racist insinuation there is just stupid. I'm not, fight sports have been about the color green. Always. That's what broke the color line in boxing first time with Jack Johnson. Took a while for it to happen again for reasons that are very stupid because, well, humanity. But Joe Lewis made it, he forced the issue. And even then, man, if you don't know the messed up things that he had to do to get that title shot, again, it was green. He basically signed away a percentage of all future earnings in boxing to, uh, it was Jim Braddock, to get that shot. To, to even be considered for the title shot, Jim Braddock didn't want to fight Joe Lewis for a variety of reasons. Not the least of which was Joe Lewis was on freaking destroying machine and Jim Braddock was I don't want to say just lucky to be there because that dismisses his abilities but to make that happen money money if there's money to be made and enough security to be had that's what we'll do what hey quick question for all of you people out there again kind of crying about this why was um why was Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in Zaire, because the murderous dictator at the, of Zaire at the time, put up a bunch of money? Money. That's kind of it. <laughs> I'm sure they looked into running something in Nigeria. I'm sure they did. Couldn't come together for whatever reason. I'm sure they're looking into something in South Africa. Will anything come of it? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But 
Yeah. This is not worth getting your panties on a bunch over. Um, so again, that's for what's next. Duplicy and Adesanya makes the most sense. Question is if the timing will line up for what the UFC wants, which is always a question. Um, if you don't, I'm not the biggest fan of the immediate rematch. Um, I would like to see Strickland face like Paulo Costa. Um, I think Costa's got a fight coming up, but something like that. You know, that's that's what would in, that's what I would like to see. I I'm not opposed to Strickland being back in the title picture, but I don't know that an, an immediate rematch is warranted. Um, yeah, so that was your main event. Um, certainly saved the last handful of fights, I think. <laughs> and you know, not an all-timer, not even the best fight on the card from where I sit, but I don't make those decisions. And, and that brings us to the co-main event, about which the less said the better. This fight sucked. Raquel Pennington wins a unanimous decision, 49-46 twice, won 49-45 over Myra Buena Silva. This fight sucks. What do you want me to say? Um, Buena Silva has a decent first round. Had a couple of moments in some of the other rounds, but she just couldn't sustain momentum. She had her couple of gimmick things. I, I say gimmick like they're just overly silly. That's not what I mean. I mean, she had like three ideas and was just really committed to those. She kept trying ninja chokes, which Pennington never got into proper position for. You need to be, you need to like overcommit in the clinch to kind of get caught in those. And she was, Buena Silva would threaten them, but Pennington was very well prepared for them. So she never let her head get too far down, never let that choke really develop, never let the other arm come into play. Um, just, it was very, very well prepared for that. Um, but Buena Silva's defense is terrible. She got hit with everything, but the, everything that Pennington threw pretty much landed, it felt like. It was not a very auspicious performance from Buena Silva. I'm not quite going to throw this under the same category of like Irene Aldana and, when she just had nothing at all for Amanda Nunes. That would be a little bit unfair. But, man, not a... And Pennington's quarter... Look, I give Pennington's coaches full credit for this. They were telling her exactly what was up. Every time you throw, you hit her. She doesn't respond to it well. Stop clinching. Trust your hands. And you got her. And every time they got close, they'd clinch. Because this is just what they both do. Is one of those things about good fighters. They don't just fall back on habits. They make adjustments. They make reads. And they go from there. Um, none of that was present here. A uh, lot of clinching. Takedowns. Just not a lot happened here. Um, this is one of those. This is one of the reasons that you know, I'm going to mention this fight later when we talk about it. But Dana White, after the fight, going, you know, Movsarov, Loyev, and Arnold Allen was the worst time anyone had watching a fight. Like my man, that was not the worst fight on this card, much less of all time. Um, this fight was worse, much worse. Um, not a lot here. Pennington probably should have been able to finish this in the fifth. She spent like three and a half minutes in full mount threatening an arm triangle, and just nothing came of it. Um, Silva Gap, Buena Silva Gas was one of the big problems. She really, first time you go five, man, it's one thing to be scheduled for five, it's another thing to go for five, and first time going for five, it's a new experience. So there's that. Um, this division is a wasteland. Just Terrible. I saw Luke Thomas mention, you know, if you're Valentina Shevchenko, do you really want to keep messing around with Alexa Grosso, or do you go back up to bantamweight, where that path is pretty darn clear? If Valentina Shevchenko tomorrow said, like, I'm fighting Raquel Pennington at UFC whatever, like, is anybody picking Pennington? Anybody? I'm not. I'm certainly not. 
Raquel Pennington's longevity in the sport is somewhat commendable. I don't mean to dump on her entirely. This is a criticism of the division writ large. And it goes something like this. Raquel Pennington first fought for this title and got blown out of the water by Amanda Nunes in 2018. It was May of 18, so five, almost six years ago. I hate that 2018 was that far, was, you know, that long ago, but c'est la vie, right? In that time, nobody new showed up. If your claim to the title is literally, I stuck around, all the people who were better than me left, and nobody better than me showed up, like, I'm not, like, there's specifics about Pennington's performance here that I can criticize, but that state of being, the fact that those are the circumstances in which we, we find ourselves, is not her fault. Nobody showed up. Um, this division is just... Dude, if Ronda Rousey came back tomorrow, she could probably win this belt. I mean that. Amanda Nunes, I think, in the back made some noise about maybe coming back from retirement in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, she would beat the crap out of Raquel Pennington again. Uh, but, again, that's not that's not Pennington's fault that the division sucks. It just kind of is what it is. I don't know who she'll fight next. I don't... Uh, maybe a rematch with Ketlin Vieira because reasons. Uh, let me look at the rankings here. Okay, okay, let's have a look here. Women's bantamweight. Do, do, do. Uh, Juliana Pena is probably next and will probably win the belt again and no one will care. Um, yeah, there's like Vieira, Irene Aldana. Aldana had a nice and I mean, the her fight with Carol Hosa was fun. Holly Holm still at six. Like, let me just read this list to you, and you tell me how depressing this is. Okay, tell me how depressing you find this. The rankings haven't been updated, but new champion Raquel Pennington, Juliana Pena, Myra Buena Silva, Caitlin Vieira, Irene Aldana, Holly Holm, Penny Kienzad, Yana Santos, Macy Chasson. Carol Hosa, Misha Tate, Norma Dumont, Julia Avila, Josiane Nunes, and Chelsea Chandler. What are we doing here? Seriously, what are we doing here? This division has been bad for a while. Okay, and I'm not the only one who said that. But it's been bad for a while. What propped it up was... Look, originally, okay, we're just trying to coalesce things. Here's Ronda Rousey. Yay, she's great. And we'll bring in other fighters, and we're trying to get a division going. You, you acquire Strike Force, acquire some outside talent that wasn't in Strike Force, and we'll, you know, we're developing the division. Give it a grace period because, of course. And then eventually Ronda's star power was a little bit like, okay, we're, this, we're watching this for Ronda. And then Holly Holm knocked her out. And then Misha, who had a bit of... So you had a bit of celebrity factor here with Ronda, Holly, and Misha. And then you had Nunez. And Nunez just bulldozed everything into the ground. And that's not her fault. When I must say that's not her fault. Like, no, she did it intentionally, but it's not her fault that the end result was so devastating to the division. She flattened everybody. She beat Everybody. Everybody. And so the story became, why do we care about women's bantamweight? Because here's this historic dominant figure at the top. Okay, that's fine. But if you took a look at the health of the division, and some of us did, you went, this isn't great. Like, Nunez is propping this up. And when she left, meant that title, was, uh, Amanda retired in what, June of last year? Might have been like early June... Let me look this up because it should not be difficult to find. 
Um, do second title reign. Yeah, June 10th. She defeats Irene Aldana, retires. Fair enough. Out on top. Best women's fighter ever. Probably. One title defense short of Ronda Rou- of tying Ronda Rousey's record, though, interestingly enough, but she beat a, I think she beat a better co- uh, level of opposition than Ronda had. And her career overall was longer anyway. Nah. So, not to get into that debate. But from June 10th, 2023 to January 20th of 2024, that title was vacant. Completely and utterly vacant. There is not another title in the UFC that that would be true of. If Drickus Duplessis tomorrow announced he had some horrible disease and reti- illness and retired. If uh, Sean O'Malley tomorrow retired. It, it, go down the list. Don't care. Dude, even like uh, women's flyweight. You know, if Alexa Grasso retired tomorrow or Zhang Wei Li. That belt, that vacancy would be filled at the earliest opportunity. The earliest. I don't, again, I don't care what division we're talking about. I mean, they tr- Look at what they did with light heavyweight. They tried forever to get that thing stable. And every time it fell apart, as soon as possible, they went, okay, here's the date, here's the fighters, we're go- boom, title in rotation, we're going. When you spend seven months on the shelf... A title spends seven months on the shelf, not a peep. That says a lot about that division. It says a lot about it. So, fight sucked. And that's all I'm going to say. Uh, next up, okay, guys. Go back and listen to me last week. I picked Mike Malott here. Freely admit it, got this one wrong. But I had to... Th- I This is one I probably should have gotten right. If you listen to me hem and haw about it, like I have an instinct and I kind of ignore it, or it's close enough that I, and here we are, but what did I, what did I say? If you make Neil Magny a near three to one underdog, and the UFC official broadcast had him at plus 295 when this fight started, say so nothing of how he was going into the third, which is probably much, much wider. We'll get to the fight in a second. But you put that much plus money on a guy as proven? Dude, Neil Magny may never be a world beater. He's a gatekeeper, and I say that with respect. But that man is battle-tested. He has been through the wars. He has been through the problems. He has been beaten and battered and bloodied and finished, or beaten and battered and fought back. Hector Lombard dropped bombs on that man for five minutes, and he persevered came through it, and beat the crap out of Hector Lombard during the stoppage. He's been run over by guys like Gilbert Burns or Rafael Dos Anjos or, dude, I'm talking, let me save Lorenz. No, Lorenz Larkin beat the crap out of him. Like, Demian Maia kind of ran him over. Like, he's had the setbacks. But he's got enough experience and enough savvy that against a guy as junior-ish in his career as Mike Malott was, who despite being 32, only 12 fights into his career, only three in the UFC, you, if you're, if you're setting the odds and you have to pay that out, you're asking for trouble. Malott was completely unproven at anything approximating the level of Neil Magny. And I, you can go back and listen to last week's show if you think I'm lying. I said, I picked him a lot, barely, not confidently, and th- those odds I did not feel were reflective of the actual odds of this fight. Through two and a half rounds, it looked like they were, but 
One of the beautiful things about MMA, I suppose. It's not over till it's over, right? There is no deficit so steep that you cannot come back from and get a win as long as the fight is not stopped. And sometimes you're talented, but you're untested. And a guy like Neil Magny will test you. That was one of the big things I was... One of the reasons I kind of thought Magny had a shot against Ian Machado Gary. The short notice kind of ruined that. And then Gary had a very good... Um, he actually had a pretty good read on Magny. So, for reasons, that didn't play out. But same kind of thought process here. And turns out, Neil Magny not quite ready to be cashed out. And Mike Malott, I hate this phrase. I really do. Because people throw it around way too much. Uh, uh, this is what they do. They call it fraud checking. Like, you got fraud checked. I don't think that's fair of Mike Mal- to say of Mike Malott here. He lost in a fight he should have won. And I can say that pretty darn confidently because Malott won through two rounds. First two rounds are Mike Malott pretty handily. He's landing leg kicks and calf kicks, which have, I mentioned the Lorenz. Um, who was it I saw say this? Um, might have been Shaquille Majori. But somebody on Twitter mentioned, uh, the, he's not the only one who said it. He's the one that I saw and he's the one I responded to personally. Um, not that my Twitter response is like some, it's nothing. Like my, my Twitter following is pathetic. At Winfrey MMA, if you're curious. <laughs> Uh, W-I-N-F-R-E-E, two E's. Um, but, like, oh boy, did Ian Machado Gary do serious permanent damage to Neil Magny's left leg, and I had to just kind of poke my head out of the sand and go, guys, I remember August of 2016, and I remember what Lorenz Larkin did to him. And the official stoppage was due to elbows in the first round, he tore Neil Magny apart with leg kicks before the elbow before the elbows finished things. Leg kicks have been a weakness. Okay, Rafael dos Anjos. How did he beat Neil Magny in 3:43 of the first? He leg kicked him to off balance him, got on top, arm trialed him very quickly. This was 2017 Rafael dos Anjos. Um, maybe not the best version of RDA ever, but a very very but very near to it. Just ran him over like that. Leg kicks have been a problem for this guy for a long time. Even in fights, he's won. Ma- Ian Machado Gary did not discover some chink in the armor. These have always been there. But he was still landing them, and they were they were not pleasant. He was landing better punches. He had better clinch work, which is a bit rare. Magny usually has a pretty decent clinch. He had the takedowns. Like when I say he was better than Matt, he was beating Magny everywhere. I mean it. They showed all the major facets of MMA and Mike Malott beat him everywhere. That's, <laughs> that's just kind of how that went. Then third round, we're getting more of the same. He, he mounts Neil Magny pretty early into that round. I think he had him mounted near the end of the second too. Mounts him. Magny the, just, not going to quit. He's not hurt enough to be, you know, undeterred. He's just in a bad spot. So he shrimps, hip escapes, comes up on kind of a double leg. Mike Malott reaches for a guillotine, then he gets slammed out of it. And suddenly, it's not exactly here that the wheels come off, but every moment of this fight up until that point, Mike Malott had been very good. Then suddenly he's on his back and Neil Magny's on top in his full guard, mind you. This is not on top in a dominant position. This is on top in full guard. And Mike Malott kind of turns into me. Not exactly me. I would have done much worse. But I couldn't replicate what Mike Malott did in the first 10, 12 minutes of this fight. I couldn't do it. Put a gun to my... If my life depended on it, if you put me in there with Neil Magny and said, win a round or you die... I'm probably going to die. <laughs> like that's that he's a professional fighter, I am not. And but then again, he, he suddenly turns into like he's off of his back, he like goes for kind of a kurdo kurdo sweep. 
We have a different kind of sweep out of the Kuro Kuro Guard. I'm a little bit oversimplifying because I use that term a bit more loosely than the pure jujitsu guys do. Um, mostly because it's easier to just say that than to go into 18 different derivations. But the Kuro Kuro is kind of like they're standing above you. You're on your you're on your back. You've got guard or something close to it. They stand up and then you um, you reach down and you like cup the ankle, uh, and then you pull it back and you push up with your feet and you kind of not uh, you. Pull the feet out, push them back, and they go down, right? That's the theory, anyway. You can look it up online. Um, again, you'll find guys who might use slightly different names for it, or there's grabbing both legs is different than grabbing one leg, and yeah. Again, that, that's just two in the weeds for the purposes of this kind of conversation. So he kind of hits one of those, but Magni's against the fence. So he doesn't land flat. He kind of bounces there. And Malat doesn't try to get up. He instead grabs at a leg, and we get into kind of a leg entanglement, and you're just not going to win that against Neil Magny unless you're very good. Magny spins through, gets into leg drag, which is a horrible position to be in. For if, if you're the one being leg dragged, um, for those of you who don't know, leg dragging is it's kind of like arm dragging. If you know wrestling, arm, you grab the arm, you drag it across the body. Wonderful thing for wrestling and dirty boxing and all kinds of clinch fighting. Leg dragging is... Imagine you're kind of in half guard, but instead of the top, instead of the outside leg being on the outside of your body, you've detached, you've unhooked it, pulled it across in front of your torso. Like a knee shield gone very, very wrong. You, What you wind up doing there is you force someone's hips and legs to rotate one direction. In this kind of example, for the sake of argument, let's say it's their left leg going across your body to your left. So you're rotating it to your left, and you've got pressure on the shoulders going to your right. It's horrible. It sucks. And he didn't know what to do from there. Neil Magny knew what to do from there. He passed into mount. And then Malat had nothing. And Magny just hit him and then got back mount and kept hitting him, and the ref stopped it. Um... The, this was one of the most amazing statistical comebacks you'll ever find. It, through the first couple of rounds, hang on, the, the stat line here is nuts. Um, and, sorry, lost my place here. There, there it is. So, the stats on this one... If we go by round, yeah, round one, Mike Malott lands 20 significant strikes. We have totals. I don't actually care about the difference between significant and... Okay, they were all deemed significant. So, round one, um, 20 to 5 significant strikes in favor of Mike Malott. Round two... 21 to 6, significant. If we go to total, it gets worse. It's 67 to 18 in the second round. Like, that's a statistical beating. Round 3, oh, by the way, round uh, round 2, Malat also had 3 minutes and 8 seconds of control time between time he spent uh, controlling the clinch and time on top. Then we get to round 3. And the significant strike differential goes as such. 46 to Neil Magny, 4 from Malott. Uh, if we go total strikes, it's 80 to 13. One of the most wild turnarounds you'll ever see. Um, Mike Malott was Canada's last hope for a male victory on the evening. Um... Canadian fighters had a bad night here, actually. Um, who won? Two women did. But all the men went like 0-7. 0-7, hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, 0 and 7. Um, might be 0-8 and 8 if you want to count Arnold Allen. Because he, he trains with Faraz Sahabi, but he fights out of England, so I don't know if you want to count it, but... Yeah, Canadian MMA, in a, in a bad spot, man. 
They're in a bit of a rut. Let me let me talk about this for just a second. Um, in fairness to Canadian MMA, because a lot of people were like ragging on the guys for this performance. One, one of these was a close split decision that could have gone the Canadian's way, and I thought did, but Ukrainian Canadian, but eh. So let's get, let's cut that guy a break first. Second. MMA talent is kind of cyclical. Um, if you remember the glory days of Canadian MMA, George St. Pierre, um, you had kind of his heir apparent in Roy McDonald. Uh, there were other guys coming out of that. I, I don't want to go through the whole list, because but think about that era. Like, um, There were several very, very good Canadian fighters who either were champions or fought for the belt. Across multiple weight classes. At that same time, do you want to know, like, Australia at that time had produced, like, Elvis Sinisek, Anthony Parash, and, oh, who was that third guy? Um, if you want to count New Zealand in the mix, we could maybe add Mark Hunt. Was I for, No, Hunt, Hunt's Australian. We'll, we'll, we'll say Mark Hunt. I don't, do I, want to say, I don't want to dismiss Mark Hunt in the way that I'm about to... You know, and I'm not trying to d- knock like Elvis... Dan Kelly, that was it. Dan Kelly. Love Dan Kelly, but... <laughs> that guy's body was a physical wreck by the time he got to the UFC because he was a multiple-time judo uh, Olympian in judo. And judo will wreck your body, man. But, you know... Respect to the king of rock and rumble, Elvis Sinisek, or the hippo, Anthony Parash. I remember those without looking them up. Like Those guys aren't UFC champions. They never sniffed the belt. Look what they got now. Not just maybe the best fighter in the world, certainly one of them, but they've produced several, That the Oceanic region has produced several very, very good fighters. You know, you, you got Volkanovski, you had Robert Whitaker, Adesanya, Dan Hooker, I could go on. But that's the point. It's a bit cyclical. Canadian MMA is down right now. It's been down for longer than I think most of us predicted it would be down, but that's not the end of the world. I, there's too many people up there, and there's too many people who are good for all of them to flame out. You know, it's, it's statistically unlikely. Um, and Malat looked, yeah, man, I hate to say someone should have won a fight they lost when they get stopped, but the mountain of evidence suggests that Mike Malat should have won this fight. He made a couple of bad decisions and then didn't know how to deal. And it's unfortunate that this is a pretty non-trivial setback. He's 32. Now that's not the end of the world, but at welterweight, it's, this was his chance to kind of, you know, put a stamp on some things. Dude, beating Neil Magny is not easy. Uh, he's been about 500, you know, 50-50 over his last handful of fights. But it, look at who's beaten him for just a second in his last few losses. So, Shavkat Rachmanov, my opinion, future champion. Gilbert Burns, who's really darn good. And then he stepped in on short notice to fight Ian Machado Gary. And before that, what? Michael Chiesa... Then you got to go back to like 2018 for Ponzinibbio. Like, well, beating him is not easy at all. And Mike Malott was beating him. So he's he's not a... He had a chance here, though, man. Again, beating Neil Magny, handing Magny his first losing streak since 2013, which is what it would have been, by the way, in Canada to be the only Canadian guy to get a win... <laughs> It would have been big. Said he lost. Uh, in a bad way, too. So, I don't know. That's a tough loss, man. That's a tough loss. Um, respect to Neil Magny. A lot of other guys would have quit. Mentally, at least. Would have given up on themselves after those first couple of rounds. Not Neil Magny. Pushed through. Never champion. Probably never going to be champion, but... Um, that guy has just been, dude, Magny's been with the UFC for what, uh, 10 years. 
His UFC debut was February of 13, so he's about to hit 11. Next month, in about a month, 11 years in the UFC. You don't spend that much time in the UFC by accident. And he's due the decline. Uh, again, he's 36, 40 fights, 11 years in the UFC. I mean, he's got some weird records. I mean, he's currently tied for most decision wins in UFC history at 14. That's just decisions. He's also tied for most for the second most unanimous decision wins at 10. And he has the most fights that have gone to decision in welterweight history at 17. And he has the most split decision wins in UFC welterweight history at four. I mean, he's not easy to get out. He's got, um, he's got the most wins in UFC welterweight history, right? Yeah, 22. This man's success is not accidental. And this, this is one of those ones I feel like I should have... If you listened to me talk about it last week, I should have known better. Or at least, I should have been willing to take the chance. I, was, I think I said, I said this, like, if I was gambling with money I didn't mind losing, I would have gambled on Neil Magny here, and I would have been paid. <laughs> I would have been paid pretty well. Uh, all right, next up, middleweight Chris Curtis defeats Marc-Andre Barrio via split decision. Um, a 29-28 for Barrio, and then two 30-27s for Curtis. I was 30-27 for Curtis. 29-28 for Barrio is not out of line. The first two rounds of this fight are dreadful. It's saved by the third when they both kind of wake up and start fighting a little bit. Um, I, I gave Curtis all three rounds. Not going to die on that particular hill. <laughs> Uh, the only definitive round of the fight was the third, which I do think definitively went to Chris Curtis, but, you know, can't do anything about that. Um, they got booed a lot in the first two rounds, and part of the problem here was by the time they picked it up, there was still a little bit of animosity carrying over from the previous ten minutes that I think was unfair. The first two rounds are not great, but I think they're pretty poor. But... They both kind of went, all right, fine, let's fight in the third. And we got a good, that third round's a good round. It's not a great round, it's a good round. And it saved that fight um, from being the worst. If that third round had gone the way the first two did, this would have been the worst fight on the card, including Pennington and Buena Silva, in my opinion. But um, I like Curtis, so I'm happy to see him succeed. Good on him. Uh, kicking off the main card, we have uh, Movsar Vloyev defeating Arnold Allen via unanimous decision, 29-28 across the boards. I went 30-27 of Vloyev in real time. Um, I was, I don't think I should have given him the third in retrospect. I haven't had time to rewatch the round, but just rethinking it, I don't think I was right there. Um, Vloyev's good. It's been true for a while, but. Uh, he had some good striking. Not great, but good enough. He couldn't really control Allen, which was the big thing. He could get him down with a little bit of effort, but struggled for real control. Um, had a really gnarly scramble in the third when Eloyev got a takedown, but he kind of fell into a ninja choke, and then his scramble to get out of that was remarkable. Then the fact that he didn't even concede position while doing it. like He got out and still was on top. Like, my hat's off to you, man. That's tough. That is real tough to do. Um, Allen just... The takedown was a bit of a problem. His offense just never really got going. His jab was okay in the first, but the problem is... One, he struggled to land calf kicks, which is a big part of his offensive arsenal. Um, couldn't quite get them going against... Ivloyev. Then he, to stop the takedown, he started hanging the lead hand low, which is fine. It helps you. It helps you get an underhook right away. It can help with down blocking. Like there's reasons to keep that hand low if you're worried about being taken down. It just neuters your neuters is the strong word. It changes your jab in such a way that it's usually less effective. 
and you're a little less inclined to throw it because if they time it, suddenly your de- a lot of your defense goes away. Um, I've loved just out wrestled in the first couple of rounds. Um, third round, I, here's the most interesting thing about the not the only interesting thing. This was not a bad fight. Again, Dana White crapping on it after the fact was did not agree with him at all, at all. Uh, about this being like the worst time anyone had watching a fight. Like, no, sorry. There was a there was one guaranteed worse fight than this on this card, with your co-main event, and you could argue Curtis and Barrio was worse. Um, I might even that's an argument I might even make personally if push came to shove. But third round, we get a bit of controversy here. So if Loyev goes for a takedown, Arnold Allen defends, gets kind of a front headlock. He's a little bit off to the side, so it could either be. Um, it's kind of a power, what do they call it, like a power half or a power three-quarter Nelson or a, a three-quarter stack or like a power Nelson. I've heard it called both, and there's a little bit of a difference between each one, but if you know what I'm talking about, it'll give you an idea of the position. Uh, and for anyone else, front headlock will suffice. And Evloyev is bent over at the waist with this and has one hand kind of on the ground, fingertips, and Arnold Allen starts kneeing him in the head. He's pu- He's lifting up pushing him backwards, and then kneeing, and the hand's kind of down, and it's kind of not. And they get to the fence, and the referee breaks things up. And commentary is confused. People on Twitter are annoyed. Let me say the following. Uh, I'll, I understand the annoyance. This was a offensive flurry from Allen that was his best offense of the fight. He cut Avloyev with some of these knees. I don't think he was seconds away from a finish or anything silly like that. But the stoppage resulted in a momentum break that really hurt him and hurt his chances of winning, of getting something really going in that third round. Commentary was confused because the hand was down and then he did... Alan was trying to do the same thing to Evloyev that Gegard Mousasi did to Chris Weidman. Similar position. Weidman was on his feet, but bent down and touched the ground with both hands to stop himself from being kneed in the head. So Gegard Mousasi, holding a front headlock, hiked up on it to pull his upper body and his hands off of the mat, and then before he can get his hands back to the mat, he kneed him in the head. Perfectly legal. The caveat here is, and Mark Goddard took to Twitter to clarify this, because bear in mind, people who paid attention to this thing knew this was a possibility anyway. The rules that we were operating under here are different. So, ladies and gentlemen, the stupidity of the unified rules of MMA. For a long time, the rule was anything, anything, other than the soles of your feet touching the mat meant you were downed and you could not be kicked or kneed in the head. I lived through the dark ages of fighters that you call it playing the game. I'm pressed against the fence. Oh, I might get kneed in the head. So I put one hand down. I'm touching the mat. You can't kick me or knee me in the head. And if the other guy's not aware of that, then he throws the knee to the head and then we got a problem. I lived through this stupidity and... Several years ago, there was an attempt made to course correct this where the rule was changed to you need both fists or palms flat on the mat to be considered downed. Obviously, or a knee or on your, like, if, you're, if your knee or your butt is down, you're downed. Like, this is about, like, what do you do with your hand? How are you downed if your hands are up or down, right? That seems to be the point of contention here. And it changed to, okay needs to be both, then it changed to be, well, it can be one, but it has to be weight-bearing, and there's all these little finicky things about this. Well, for those not in the know, the Ontario Athletic Commission, I forget the technical name for them, so for the sake of argument, I'm just going to say the Ontario, because this took place in Toronto. Oh, by the way, Chris Curtis, coming out to Edge's um, theme song from WWE, now AEW, he has the same, Edge has the same music. Coming out to that in Toronto, um... I appreciated that. Some nice little uh, good-natured trolling for the Canadian fans. Um, But 
the Ontario Commission had has adopt when they had, when they started sanctioning MMA, they adopted the rule set that the New Jersey State State Athletic Control Board had adopted in 2003, and they have not updated since. Now, New Jersey has changed some of what they sanction, and the, I think they're more on board with the more unified rules. Ontario does not recognize those new rules. They don't even recognize straw weight. I think it was. <laughs> they, technically speaking, Ontario does not sanction or recognize the straw weight division, if you want to get technical. And they got another weird rule, like coaches and seconds are not allowed to yell advice to their fighter during a round. No one enforced this, by the way, but that was the rule. But in 2003, guess what the rule was about being a downed fighter? Anything other than the soles of your feet on the mat means you're downed. Mark Goddard looked at, at this flurry and he let the first like three knees go because Allen had kind of timed them right. And again, he was kind of pulling up. There was one when they got to the fence where Evloyev's fingers, most of his hand, is touching the mat. You're downed. That's the rule set they're fighting under. Guess what? Guess what? Who? De- what determines who wins a fight, guys? It's the rules. If you think I'm lying, watch what happens if you go into a boxing match and knock someone out with a head kick. Who won that fight? It ain't you if you threw the head kick. <laughs> the rules determine who wins. Period. The rules they were fighting under were anything other than the soles of your feet on the ground means you're a downed opponent and you cannot be kicked or kneed in the head. This is stupid, by the way. I am not advocating for this rule set. But Mark Goddard, ultimately speaking, I think, made the right call. He did not take a point. He checked on Evloyev. He let the first, like, three knees go because they were legal or close enough to legal. They were legal from where he could do in real time, figure this out, which is very, very difficult to do. Those looked good to him. One happened that wasn't. He halted the action. That's what the referee is supposed to do. Mark Goddard did not screw Arnold Allen here. Okay? The rule set is stupid. Now, if you're... This is one of those things, man. If you're a fighter, you have to know what rules you're going to be fighting under. You have to. This is where my former co-host Jeff Harris would go, we need a national commission. Which I've started to come more and more around on the idea of as time has gone on, believe it or not. I'm a small government guy. But then I'd have to point out, this is Canada, not the United States. So even if there were a national commission in the United States of America, Canada wouldn't necessarily be subject to the same rules. But the perils of international promotion. Guys, let me just say this. The unified rules of MMA are not the best rules for MMA. I've beat this drum before. I'm going to beat it again. The, they call them the global rule set. The glo- uh, something to that effect. The global rules are the rules that 1FC operates under. They allow elbows. They allow kicks and knees to the head of a downed opponent. And they allow, uh, they score the fight as a whole, rather than round by round. Look, man, I'm not here to advocate for every bit of one's product, I, which I, I like one as a general rule. I'm certainly not here to advocate for the people running the place. That is the superior rule set. Scoring fights as a whole when you have limited rounds is better. And let's take away the stupidity of... Is this guy downed? What constitutes downed? Here's a thought. It doesn't matter. Now, the only distinction I would like to make here, I think if you want to ban stomps, I'm okay with you banning stomps. And if you want to say that if someone is 
flat on the ground, you have to be likewise grounded to knee them in the head. I'd be so part of what you if you want to avoid full on soccer kicks. Easy way to change this. You if you're both down, you're free to kick a knee in the head. This changes leg lock attacks and defenses. This radically alters the positional hierarchy. Um, north south or a prolonged front headlock sprawl position. That. It, go watch some old pride fights, man. Guys are lit up from there if they get stuck there. In fact, one of the grossest um, disfigurations you'll ever see in MMA, look up um, Ricardo Arona, probably should be Ricardo Arona, and uh, Kazushi Sakuraba. Sakuraba tries for a single leg, gets sprawled on, and Arona spends several minutes kneeing him in the head before that fight gets stopped. He is a disfigured mess. Let's let's do this. Again, we can fiddle with like, okay, if someone else is fully on the ground and you're fully upright, no kicks to the head. Okay, maybe we can work with that. If we're both on the ground, man, there are guys who you, who can light people up from side control with knees to the head. Um, Hayato Sakurai used to do that on occasion. Josh Barnett would do it. Heath Herring, again, he was a monster if you tried to take him down and he sprawled on you. Um, or he would just knee the crap out of your head from um, the top of a front headlock kind of thing. That's the superior rule set. It's better, full stop, than the unified rules of MMA. And that's just kind of how it is. But only two states allow for the use of that rule set, Colorado and... um, Georgia. So guess where the UFC won't be going, by the way? Either of those places. But look, if we had those rules... Now, here's the other thing. There's people who do the do the pearl clutching. There's data on this. It doesn't come up as often as you think. Because most fighters realize, oh, okay, if I can't stay here, I won't get here, or I move with more urgency. And it comes up more often in lighter weight classes that are more mobile anyway. But hey, California or Nevada, they won't let you use these different rules for MMA that are just fine. They're, those rules are every bit as safe, put air quotes around safe if you want to, as the unified rules of MMA. But they'll sanction CTE for money and power slap you. Hypocrites. Every single one of you. I, I yelled about that before. Not going to yell about it right now. Not worth it. Hypocrites. Moral cowards, ethical hypocrites. That's all they are. Anyway. um, That's the only thing I really wanted to talk about coming out of that fight. There's a superior rule set out there. I'd like if we used it. That was your main card. I had some optimism, and then I got kicked in the teeth for being optimistic. C'est la vie. On the prelims, um, Garrett Armfield defeated Brad Katona via unanimous decision. Bit of an upset here. I thought Katona would pull that out, but... Armfield had good boxing and was good enough to stop enough of the takedowns. Um, competitive fight. I agree that Armfield won. Featherweight. One of my upset picks that paid off. I I had a couple of those. Look, I'm more than happy to eat crow when I get, you know, uh, Mike Mallott and Neil Magny wrong or the co-main event wrong. And I did. I picked Buena Silva and she was not ready for the task. You pat myself on the back just a little bit when I look at the odds and go, I don't think that's right. Um, Sean Woodson defeat, defeated Charles Jordan via split decision, 29-28. I thought Woodson had this a bit cleaner than that, personally. Played out kind of how I thought. Long, dude, Woodson is 6'3". And he fights at featherweight. What the? There's, there's photos of him when he was a heavyweight boxer. Um, you know, 200 pounds north of. Now fights at 145 and is just can hit you from across the ring. Like the next county over, if something if something hits you, you look over there. Again, one county over, there's Sean Woodson waving and punching you in the face. Jordan just wasn't ready to deal with it. Um, I, the, a couple of the rounds were close enough that I'm not up in arms over a split, but I thought Woodson had this a bit. I, I scored, I think I scored all three rounds for Woodson, but 
Eh. So good win for Sean Woodson. Good win for him. He's a tough character to deal with at well at featherweight. Uh, we had a bantamweight fight where Ramon Taveras missed weight. He weighed one thirty nine point seven five, so basically one hundred and forty pounds. Um, he defeated Sari City via a split decision, twenty nine twenty eight. So I picked City. Um, this fight could have gone either way. 29-28, either way is perfectly fine. One of the scorecards I objected to, um, I don't remember what it was. Okay. So, um, Tavares gets the first round. He struggles through most of it, but near the end, he pretty badly rocks City. Gets the first round. Second is close, and then I thought City had the third pretty cleanly. Um... So if you want to argue which way the second round went, okay, we can have a discussion. It's why I'm not up in arms over a split. One of these idiot judges going, uh, giving Tavares the third. I don't agree with that at all. At all, at all. Um, That scorecard in particular, don't like. 29-28 for Tavares, giving him the first two. I can see it. Really can. He won the first, and, you know, again, close second. Uh, Wasn't up in arms either way. Got it wrong. Could have gone my way on the predictions, but this should have been your fight of the night. Bloody, action-packed. Wasn't because Dana White wanted to say, thank you for saving our pay-per-view from being total dog crap. And didn't want to try and justify, I don't know, maybe he just didn't want to give City 100 grand because Tavares missed weight and they weren't going to give him a bonus, even though they've done that in the past. Because, hey, hey, what do you mean? They're more like guidelines than rules, right? Um, then Jillian Robertson defeated Pollyanna Viana via TKO punches, uh, 312 of the second. Robertson just better everywhere, pretty much. Um, on the earliest of prelims, Sam Patterson defeated Johan Lanus. This is the one I should have got right. Of the one, uh, of all the ones I got wrong, again, City could have gone my way. I probably should have stuck with my gut about Neil Magny. This one I really should have got right. Um, good win for Sam Patterson. Um, Jasmine Jazdavisius beat the crap out of Priscilla Cachuea. And submitted her with a Darce choke. Do not believe the lies of Wikipedia. Bruce Buffer said it was an anaconda. Bruce Buffer was wrong. This was a Darce choke. If you don't know how to tell the difference, anaconda chokes start at the neck. They both involve one arm being trapped and then one arm wrapping around and coming through. If the arm that goes around the opponent's neck starts at the neck and not at the trapped arm, it's an anaconda. Anacondas start at the neck. Um, Credit to uh, Kaposa for hipping me to that. I've always known the difference, but that's a nice mnemonic device. Darce chokes start at the trapped arm. This had the choking arm of Jazz Divisius starting at the trapped arm of Priscilla Cachuea. It's a Darce, not an anaconda. I don't care what the ref says. I don't care what Bruce Buffer announced. This was a Darce. Deal with it. This was a comical mismatch. They could have stopped this fight in the middle of the second or between rounds. Jazz Davisius beat the crap out of Priscilla Cachuea. This is a historic beating. I'm not joking when I say that. This is statistically a historic beating. If we go by total strikes, when it's all said and done, Jazz Davisius landed 326 to 26 from Cachuea, and 19 of those were in the third round for her before she got taken down again. That second round could have been a 10-7. Probably should have been. One judge officially gave it that. First round, Jazz Davisius gets a takedown pretty quick. She lands 138 total strikes to just five from Cachuea. Second round, it's 110 to two, but... Four, almost all of that was in mount. And then the third, she finally gets the, she beats her up enough to get the stoppage. This was a mismatch. The referee should have stopped this between rounds if her corner wasn't going to, and it's MMA. Corner stoppages are as rare as Bigfoot sightings. 
they well, I shouldn't say Bigfoot sightings because Bigfoot doesn't actually exist, but you know, they're rare as hen's teeth, as the old saying goes. They they happen from time to time, but boy, are you if you see one, you remember it forever. Um, cut for Silla Cashwaya. She should have been cut after she lost to Jillian Robertson, but spent the round trying to eye gouge her getting out of a rear naked choke. Or trying to get out of a bad position when fighting Miranda Maverick by removing her top. That's a thing that happened, if you forgot. Um, pathetic fighter. Should not be in the UFC. And kicking everything off. Here's my other upset pick that I'll pat myself on the back over. Jimmy Flick beats Malcolm Gordon via arm triangle in the second. Gordon missed weight and then retired after he lost. Um, Flick dealt with a tough-ish first round. Gordon won it. And then second round, Gordon gets over eager, pursuing punches, gets tripped up. Flick jumps on his back, transitions to an arm triangle. Good enough stuff from Jimmy Flick. And, yeah, that was your card. So, again, for my predictions, if you keep in track with me, 7-5. and five, Not my best outing. But... If that's the worst I do when this is all said and done at the end of December, I will be a happy man. I'd rather be further from 50-50 than that, but if I'm better than a coin flip when it's all said and done, I will take that as acceptable. And we'll try to do better next year. So, yeah, that's it. Um, Okay, let's move on. Took a little longer than I wanted, but eh, there was stuff to talk about. So, uh, all right, let me talk about this. So, during the build-up to this fight, of the media, one of the media days before the event, a reporter asks Sean Strickland about some of the comments he's made about, uh, this is related to, like, gay children. And he said something, you know, if you have, a, I don't agree with what Sean Strickland said here, Okay. He said, like, you know, if you love your gay kids, that makes you a weak person. I, I don't remember the exact quote, and I don't, I don't want to misrepresent what he said. You can find the exact quote, please do, so that you have full context instead of just taking my word for it. He had said some, at a bare minimum, less than charitable things. He is asked about this by a reporter, and he gets a little testy. And kind of, he doesn't fully snap at this reporter, but, you know, I don't mean to imply that the reporter in question is just baiting him to give a tirade so that he can get clickbait. I think he was asking a fair question. Look, if you come out publicly and state, here's my views on something, and someone asks you about them, that's fair. And the question, like, you can listen, you can find the clip, like, the question that was asked was not even overtly confrontational or aggressive. It was a fair question. Strickland, not happy about it, and goes off a little bit. Not, again, not a huge, that doesn't blow up or anything, but reasserts his position. And in the course of this, probably treads a little bit too close to violating some uh, hate speech laws up there in Canada. I don't think he, the, the lawyers I that have talked about this on Twitter don't think he broke said laws, but that was a line he kind of got close to, I think is fair to say. Now, that's kind of par for the course, in some respects, for fight week. After the fight, when Dana White was doing the post-fight press conference, the, I think it was the same reporter asked him about that, it was either the same reporter or someone else asked. The question was asked of Dana White. What do you think about that? Obviously, you give your fighters a lot of leash. And Dana White, I think, had a very uncharitable read on what was being asked. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm being too, even giving too much doubt to the journalist in question, but I don't think I am. And Dana does the, I don't, give i don't put a leash on people you know free speech i don't you know, we don't tell people what to believe or what to say or blah 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 you know, did that usual bit of rah-rah 
Um, and this got picked up by uh, the the Twitterverse, right? Mostly because Dana White has kind of courted the cultural political right. And I say that with some regret as a... I, I'm not going to preach to you all. And I'm not going to talk... I don't talk politics here as a general rule unless it's relevant to what we're discussing. So cards on the table, so you all know where I stand on this. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My view on things, consequently, would align more with the... We would describe as kind of culturally conservative. And to the extent that the U that the United States has devolved into a two party fallacy, and we've allowed and not just like my, we the people for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades have allowed the consolidation of power into two very entrenched organizations that seek only to perpetuate their own power is a bad thing. But to the extent that I fall on one side or the other of the political line, it tends to be more right. Not on everything, not on every issue. Please don't paint me with a broad brush. I don't do that to... I try not to do that to anyone else. I ask that you not do it with me. You don't have to agree with me. I'm not asking that you do. I say this so you understand where I'm coming from because we have to now discuss a little bit of this. And I want you to know, who, in some respects, I want you to know who I am, where I'm coming from with this. I don't like that a segment of the political punditry has now pretended to champion the cause of MMA because a lot of the other major sporting organizations have, to one degree or another, certainly publicly, fallen on the cultural and, in many cases, actually political left. So here's one that seems to be on their side, and we all rally around this, and the UFC is a bastion of free speech, and Dana White is a national treasure, and blah, 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 blah. That's a load of crap. All right. Dana White is not a national treasure or a hero. The UFC is not a bastion of free speech. If you think I'm lying about this, they look up the U look up any Muslim fighters winning post fight interview on any UFC anything other than the raw replay of an event. Look up the post fight interview for any of these Muslim fighters, Islam Makashev, um, any of them. He fought recently, so I bring him up. They all said something pro Palestinian considering there's a war going on right now between Israel and Hamas, the sort of de facto terrorist, basically, organization that runs Palestine, uh, the Palestine territories, they, you know, look, you're free to have your opinion on that conflict. And I'm not going to comment on that. I do not know enough, and I don't pretend to. Um... I'm pretty sure they also told a bunch of people when Russia invaded Ukraine a few years ago, don't say anything pro-Russian. They blocked the Russian flag. For a while, they... Okay, so the UFC had a ban on fighters bringing out flags for a while, and you can thank Edmund Shabazian for this, by the way. Um, If you don't remember this, Edmund Shabazian, when he fought... Who was it? i got to look this up now. Edmund Shabazian, this was years ago, um, he fought, which was it? Was it Brunson? I think it was Brunson. So this would have been his first loss. This was August 1st of 2020. Um, he came out with a flag. Now, here's the problem with this he did not carry a recognized flag um now that might seem weird like what do you mean recognized flags flags matter believe it or not um and recognizing flags recognizes um sovereignty or kind of what they stand for So Shabazian came out carrying the flag, an unrecognized flag of what is called the Nagorno-Karabakh, I'm probably mispronouncing that, Republic. This is an unrecognized 
regime. Now, that's an area of um, border dispute, basically, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And he seems to... And Shabazian is Armenian. Um, I think he was born in the United States, but he, Armenian heritage. Um, I think his parents were immigrants. So um, Supports that, fair enough. And he clearly has an opinion about that issue. And that's fine. Again, I don't care that he has an opinion about it. His might even be the morally justifiable one. I don't know. I know nothing about that conflict. So I don't... Not out here saying anything about that. But carrying unrecognized flags or displaying unrecognized flags causes issues. And it caused issues for the UFC. So the UFC said, fine, no more flags for a while. Then they changed it and said, yeah, flags are back and we don't care if it hurts your feelings. Never mind, you're the ones who instituted the ban in the first place. Oh, but, you know, you can carry flags, but dot, dot, dot. For a while, no Russian flags. Had Russian fighters. Wouldn't show the Russian flag. They wouldn't even display it next to fighters from Russia. Right? Normally they'd come out and you have the flag. Is, and, and, you no, know, they, they threw their universal doohickey up there. They still do that for Afghanistan. No Afghanistan flags flying over there. And don't get me wrong, the state of Afghanistan is... It's understandable if you choose not to recognize what's going on over there. When I say recognize, I don't mean acknowledge. I mean, if you choose not to recognize the current regime, which is basically just the Taliban again, um, because of everything they're doing, okay, your call. Not even saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you're not the biggest bastion of free speech that you like to pretend. <laughs> Can any fighter come out there and say something bad about um, Venom? You got pissy when people said something. Nate Diaz out there trashing the rock shoes because apparently he doesn't think they're very good. I don't own a pair, so I can't comment on that. But his opinion, no, they're not good. Did you air that? No, we had to find it via other sources. You weren't happy about it because the rock pays you money. I remember Brock Lesnar saying, I'm going to go drink a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing when Bud Light is prominently splattered all over the center of the octagon because they paid a lot of money to be there and Dana White got pissed at him about that. And Brock had to go apologize to the post-fight presser. Free speech? Not allowed to have an opinion on alcohol consumption and brands? Eh? Bastion of free speech, eh? Allowed to talk about how you're grossly underpaid? No? Don't like it? No, of course you don't, because it looks bad. Or you can talk about how you're not doing all that well, but you can't talk about fighters generally, or how much money the UFC is making relative to how much you're making. That'll get you censored in a hurry, won't it? But because free speech is a, more importantly, again, just as a minor note to Dana, when he's, part of his defense is free speech, brother, that's not a thing in Canada. There's hate laws. There's hate speech laws, which are ridiculous. As a, as a general rule, I'm kind of a free speech absolutist, personally. But know the laws of the jurisdiction you're in. No, you can't say whatever you want in Canada. You can say most of what you want, but there are rules. You can't say whatever you want in Brazil. Chael Sonnen got in trouble for trashing Brazil. Bunch of stuff you can't do in different places. Um, dude, Chris Jericho got in trouble for trashing Brazil in professional wrestling. Um, he did something, he, like some fan threw a flag at him and he you know, did what heels do and he kind of stepped on it and threw it back. And like, No, they don't like that. Um, you know, stuff like that, like this changes depending on where you are in the world. So you got to be aware of it. You know, I, my hunch is, um, uh, I'll leave that one alone. I don't need to get myself in trouble here. I'll only leave that one alone. But look, I, there's two ways to think about rights. I'm not going to go on a big civics rant here. I promise this is very, very, very brief, but it pertains to, some of the UFC's stance and some of why people are kind of rallying around it, even somewhat erroneously, and why why different places are the way they are. Like the, the two thoughts about rights are that they are inherent and the government should protect them, or that you have nothing and the government decides what rights you have. 
That's kind of it. I fall in the former camp, that you have inherent rights. I have the right to say whatever I want. You have the right to say whatever you want. It's the, gob it's the job of the government to make sure that the government does not infringe on that. Different. Look, you sign up for a private enterprise, and they say, here's our code of conduct, and there's no swearing. Like, Okay, you're voluntarily entering into this transaction. That, that's a whole other thing. I have the right to defend myself. It's the government's right to make sure it's the government's job to make sure that my right to defend myself and my life is not infringed upon. Right to free practice of like, all of these things. And the United States Constitution is founded on that philosophy. Here's the rights you have as a human being that are that are inherent to all of us because um my religious belief because we are created in God's image and therefore we inherit those. They are endowed from on high. That's actually the language, not the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, for you making it remember which one at the moment. And the job of the government is to protect them. That's the my way of thinking. And I think history bears this out. That's the really only the way it works. If you do the if you go the other direction where no the government decided what we declare what our rights are. You have a right to health care. You have a right to housing. You have a right to blah, blah, blah. That doesn't usually work because it starts meaning you have to get stuff from other people. I have a right to health care. Well, that means I get to impose upon any physician because I have a right to it, do I not? I have a right to housing, so I can kick people out of their house? Dude, South Africa did this. They declared housing a human right, and it caused a disaster for them. They're still trying to work through it. There's just, again, this is kind of the way you have to navigate this. And it's tricky to navigate, and I don't pretend to have all the answers. But Dana White, going off a little bit on a journalist, and not going off, he didn't get heated, he just... If, there, if the journalist in question, forgive me, I can't remember who it was, was acting in bad faith, Dana White actually cut them off very, very quickly and fairly nimbly. Um, and the journalist didn't really push back, didn't really engage with him. Um, but, look, do I... I tend to err on the, to fall on the side of, yes, free speech is good. If Sean Strickland wants to say stupid things, and I don't agree with a lot of his worldview... A lot of the specifics of it. I mean, again, I haven't had a conversation with the man about how he thinks the world should operate. There's opinions he holds that I do not, but I don't think he should be silenced. And if the UFC wants to stand on that particular hill, then okay, fair play. But there's some hypocrisy going on there where they are courting the idea of we are free speech absolutists while their history does not bear that out. If I remember, I was here, I was writing and watching and talking about this stuff when Nate Diaz got fined for using the F word referring to homosexuals when describing, who was it? Was it Marcus Davis? No, somebody else. But in a Twitter post or some social media post, he called him, and I apologize if this offends anybody, he called him a fag. If you're my age and the age of Nate Diaz, and, you know, if you were born in the late 70s to 80s, anywhere in the 80s, even the like early 90s, that was part of the vocabulary when you grew up, when you were a preteen and a teenager, all over the halls of junior highs and high schools in the United States. I guarantee it. If anybody says otherwise, they're a liar. Maybe exceptions for like strict religious schooling. Like there might have been Jewish schools that was not the case for, but or you know, in certain Catholic schools, but any public school, most private schools. It was everywhere. It was just, again, it was part of the vernacular. I don't... I use that as a quote here, but I don't call people that. I don't use it in private conversation or public conversation. Because I accept that, you know, things changed. But it was part of my vocabulary for a pretty decent, what, ten? Certainly a formative six years of my life. So, uh, yeah. Is what, but he got fined for that. 
And there were like threats of cutting him for violating the code of conduct. Remember when that was supposed to be a thing? <laughs> what a joke. But hey, if you're like, no, no, there was, we're free speech absolutists. Well, we haven't always been. And in some cases, you're not even now. So, well, here we are. So ugh, that annoyed me. I'm. Same vein. Same vein here. The spontaneous political chanting that takes place at uh, UFC events in particular is a little bit weird to me. I remember, again, a couple of years ago, um, during some fights, there would be the random... To avoid being censored, somebody discovered that the chant of Let's Go Brandon was an appropriate substitute for F. Joe Biden. Now, I'm not a fan of Joe Biden. Wasn't really a fan of Donald Trump either. If you... But that's a little weird. Again, it was it was said to get around the censorship so that you could chant it at events or at wrestling events or MMA events or football or basketball or whatever. And the censors would not be silencing you because you know, there's no profanity there. But again, it kind of became one of those things. That's a little weird to me. To spontaneously do that. Now, the Canadians were not worried about that. They would, if they got bored, and they had occasion to be bored more than once on this card, they just spontaneously chanted F. Trudeau. Now, I'm not exactly a fan of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to the extent that I know much about him and his policies. I have Canadian friends who most of them aren't big fans of his either. And they would know more than I would, so I kind of accept that from them. Uh, but it's just a little weird. You have nothing better to do than to chant your dispossession, your, your like dislike of a political leader. You don't have anything better to do with our time here. And it's not like it's just weird. It's just weird. I again, it's just weird. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen. I'm not saying you that there should be, you know, censorship or anything. I just talked about how I'm a pretty... I'm not commenting on whether or not these are things that should happen. I've noted that they are happening, and I'm just saying it's weird, okay? Can we agree it's a little weird? There's other stuff you could be doing, but that's what's on the forefront of your mind? I mean, the, the, some of those Toronto fans, man, they were on when they were chanting, like, F. Neil Magny. Neil Magny's not a bad dude. <laughs> or if you were the guys, like, if you were fighting a Canadian boy, were they pissed at you? Um, and Sean Strickland was, like, the folk hero up there. Good grief. The fact that by the that fifth round, there was a pretty decent DDP chant going for Drickus Duplessis is, uh, that's almost some Rocky-level stuff, right? <laughs> Don't see that very often. Um, yeah, all I'm saying is it's a little weird. You want to do it? You paid for your ticket. If you're not breaking any rules, hey, Godspeed. It's weird, and it's okay to say that it's weird. But yeah, so Dana White and Sean Strickland got into it a little bit with some reporters, and well, yeah. if I. Ha- if that had died last night when it happened, I probably wouldn't have mentioned it. But the fact that this morning, again, it kind of became part of the ecosystem. Uh, we got to talk about it a little bit, I guess. All right, the funniest story of the week, I promise we'll be quick here. You know whether or not I'm telling the truth about that. Um, trying to be quick here. The funniest story of the week. So the UFC had announced earlier that they were going to have an event in Saudi Arabia. Um, not you. All right, need a different thing. Um, it was going to be, I think their March 2nd card. Hang on. Uh, where is it? It was supposed to be, yeah, March 2nd. They were going to hold a fight night in Saudi Arabia. The Saudis paid a lot of money. They're paying 20-ish million dollars as a site fee, which is a lot of money. And the UFC said okay. 
Well, news broke earlier that, no, there will not be a UFC event March 2nd in Saudi Arabia. They'll probably go to the Apex now, would be my hunch. And the joke that came out of this um, is that... (laughs) The UFC, the UFC's like pseudo fight night or some of the rumored, like, again, there was nothing really, to the best of our knowledge, there wasn't anything really set in stone here, but that some of the stuff that was being floated was like, the Saudis just basically told them no. (laughs) Like, again, this turned into a joke and kind of got memed on in the online space. Um, Oh, Jack Slack had a great one. I forget the picture. It was like, I get $20 million, you get that flyweight who doesn't throw any strikes, and... (laughs) Um, oh, it was a heavyweight fight. I forget what it was. It was funny. A, a lot of people joked about this. That, you know, the Saudis were like, oh, so that's kind of what you want? Well, no. <laughs> so they moved the, again, That they're still, get, they're still scheduled to have an event on that date. Again, they'll probably just throw it in the apex. It'll be what it'll be. But Dana White pushed back on that and said, that's utter crap. We never proposed a card to them. Um, We always go to blow the doors off a place. And first of all, no, you don't. I've seen your cards, man. So, no. And second, I don't believe Dana White at this point. He's lied, provably, on the record, too many times for me to take anything he says at face value. Uh, I'm not saying he is lying when he says they never proposed a card and the things kind of got moved around for other reasons. They might have had a loose idea of a good card and then, you know, fighters get injured, fights fall apart, things don't line up, and they... There might not have been a scolding from the Saudis going, for $20 million, you better get something good. Uh, And it might have been just them going, okay, this isn't going to quite come together the way we want entirely possible but i'm not going to take his word for it so yeah just and nat so bear in mind naturally the ufc homers all kind of started going well i don't want the saudis dictating to the ufc guys you you think the uae hasn't been you think uh, just stop with your nonsense Um, to be clear i don't want sovereign wealth funds or or like state sponsored money to be all that involved in sports i don't like it i like it even less when it's you know the uae or saudi arabia or any of these places with like real real dubious records about human rights and all the like but i'm not going to pretend that it's not I'm not going to pretend the UFC hasn't already been kind of leveraged but like that i'm not going to pretend that you know wwe hasn't been taking blood money for years they ran an event in saudi arabia the the wwe did the same year that uh jamal khashoggi was violently murdered and dismembered on orders basically from the saudi government i'm not oh uh, and oh no now we're worried about sports washing when it affects what you think the perception of the ufc is and it affects your passive uh, consumption of the product suddenly you're pretending to care spare me either care or don't but spare me the spare me the faux hand ringing so there was that um all right ufc ufc 300 update yeah so the ufc announced two more fights for ufc 300 this last week um one of them jim miller versus bobby green great um, that's the appropriate kind of fight. Gets J- Jim Miller wanted to be on UFC 300. No problem with him fighting Bobby Green. Fight should be pretty good. No notes. Good fight. Not going to complain about that one iota. Thumbs up. Second fight. Because apparently the BMF belt is going to be a thing that is somewhat defended now. Justin Gagey. They wanted an excuse to make this fight five rounds, so they said Gagey's gimmick belt is on the line. Pfft, don't care. Justin Gagey versus, at lightweight, Max Holloway. There was a time 
this would have had me very excited. I'm not saying I'm not excited. I am saying I'm worried for Max. A little bit. I love Max Holloway. I He, for a long time, has been... He is one of my favorite fighters. I don't know where exactly, but he's probably top 10. Might even be top 5, depending on the day. Love Max Holloway. I've watched his entire UFC career, which is to say I've watched basically his entire MMA career. He uh, he came into the UFC at 4-0. and And I, I watched his UFC debut against Dustin Poirier. So... His entire career, I've watched this guy. This is a very, very tough style matchup for him. Not unwinnable, but tough. And guys, it wasn't that long ago that Justin Gagey ruined Tony Ferguson. Say whatever I said going into that fight. I picked Tony. My good friend Pat Mullen said, no, Justin Gagey's probably going to do this. He called that one right. Um, but Tony might have been slipping a little bit going into that, and I think he was. I think he came back a bit too soon from knee injury, and he was, uh, he was oh, even at that point, he was like 35, I think. He was a bit older, and he, his last couple of fights before that, he hadn't quite been the same guy he was before, still well enough to win, but not prime anymore. And then... Four and a half rounds of Justin Gagey just doing Justin Gagey things, it ruined him. He might have been he might have been on the decline anyway, but fighting Justin Gagey puts you in the passing lane to get out of the like what's the line JR uh, professional wrestling commentator Jim Ross had a great line. He was calling um I think it was one of the one of the latter matches of the TLC matches between the Dudley Boys, the Hardy Boys, and the Edge and Christian. And they're doing these crazy spots, and it was something, it was like, well, we're all in the path, we're all in the path to the grave, but there's no need to be in the passing lane. Uh, related to some of the crazy bumps those guys took. Ironically enough, I think they're all still basically in working shape. Edge came back from neck surgery. Christian's still working. Jeff and Matt, well, I mean, Jeff's got issues, but. And then Bubba's still working. I think Devon probably could. He's retired, but I think he trains. Like, he probably could wrestle if he wanted to. But, dude, fighting Tony Ferguson will age you. It, it will. He can ruin you. And I love Max, but Max gets hit a lot. I think he's absorbed more significant strikes than anyone in UFC history. Let me check that real fast. I might be able to find that. So, I mean, Max is 32, which is still young, but like I said, came into the UFC at 4-0 in 2012, so my man's been here for 12 years. February will be his 12th year, starting his 13th. Good grief. And he's achieved at an ridiculously high level. But along the way, hang on, let's see, doo, doo, doo. most total fight time, most strikes landed by an enormous margin, most significant strikes landed again by an enormous margin, and there's all those records he set with fighting both Calvin Cater and Brian Ortega. Do they not have that listed here? Hang on. Yeah, okay, so... Max Holloway, along with setting all these wonderful records and turning in some all-time great fights, and bless him, he has absorbed 2,086 significant strikes. That's a lot. And, in fact, what does he take a round on average? Let's see if I can find that actually. Oh, why are you being difficult? 
Why is your search engine so terrible? There you are. Uh, okay, do do do. Where are my defense? Yeah, again, I love Max. On average, he absorbs 4.75 significant strikes per minute. Now, again, that's averaged out over his entire career, and there's a handful of fights that have skewed that just a bit. But, and he's also landed the most significant, like, I've been over the man's records. You can't take five punches a minute, five significant strikes a minute from Justin Gagey. That's just not sustainable. And I'm kind of worried for Max in this one. It'll be a great fight. Like That's going to give us some blood and guts, and I just... Watching that fight between Gaethje and Tony Ferguson was an experience. If you'll recall, this was the first event the UFC ran after COVID restrictions had hit. They did one that was in Brazil that was the um, uh, Kevin Lee and Charles Oliveira card. Well, they didn't have fans, but it was a smaller venue, and there was just something about that fight between Gaethje and Ferguson where something about the quiet, everything you could f- hear and feel in ways that you can't normally. That fight in front of a crowd is an experience as well, but it's loud and it's energetic and it's... It's still great, but man, there is something powerful about the fact that that fight took place in front of an empty arena with every grunt and thud of impact being just echoing in your mind. That is a fight that is very difficult to rewatch. I say that as a, uh, I, I say that as like a compliment almost to both men. But that is a, that a, that was such a powerful experience watching that fight. It has it altered some of my perception about these wonderful five round wars. That all I can do is stand up and applaud a bunch of them, seriously, and wish that everyone got paid with another zero at the end of everything they make. But I am, I am a little worried for Max here, if I'm going to be honest. And that is that just dampens some of my enthusiasm. I still think that's a great fight. I think the VMF belt is a joke. But this, circle your calendars if you're going to have the stomach for it, because these two guys are going to. I don't. There is such a low chance of that fight being bad that it is statistically impossible. Not literally impossible, statistically impossible. Those two are going to fight. And I'm just... My hunch right now is just to be a little bit worried for Max. All right. Um, That is everything I have written down here. So, I went a little bit longer than I expected this time, but let me check Twitter. Pardon me. Twitter, see if anything crazy is broken. If not, we will do plugs and get out of here. Check. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah. Nothing new on Twitter. Sue plugs. Uh, Last week, damn you, Hollywood, myself and Mark Radulich got together and we talked about something very forgettable. Sorry, hang on. The beekeeper. That was it. The beekeeper. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in that, give it a listen. There is no damn you Hollywood this week. I will, however, be on the TV party tonight for Disenchantment Part Five. That will be Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. 
myself, Mark Radlich, and David Wright will get together, and we have loosely talked about every other part of Disenchantment, so now that it's wrapped up, I know it actually came out end of 2023. We're getting to it now. I don't make the schedule. Mark does. So we will get to that, and next week will be... Oh, that's that triple feature. i got to get on that. I should have plenty of time this week. So, tune in for that. We will talk about the final, again, the final part of Disenchantment. The highs, the lows, the good, the bad, the whole nine yards. And no UFC event this Saturday. Um, The WWE Royal Rumble is this Saturday, the 27th. I do not know if I'm covering it yet. I don't think so. I have not yet been asked, but, well, that doesn't stop them from asking me once, you know, week of kind of gets... It going and uh, that'll all. Ooh, I might actually get roped into that. It is um, American football playoff season. We're about ready to line up for the Super Bowl, and other people have other commitments. So we'll see. Again, not currently scheduled to. Might wind up doing it. Don't know. Find out. Um, Back here next week for a preview of UFC on ESPN Plus 93. Headlined by Roman Delidze and Nasruddin Imavov. It's a decent fight. What else do we got there? Uh, Renato Moicano and Drew Dober, Randy Brown, Muslim Salikov, Alaskarov Kizriev, and Makhud Muradov. I know I sound like I'm having a stroke. Um, Okay. That's actually an okay main card. Prelims. That's, uh... Okay. The prelims are going to be rough. Prelims are going to be a little rough. But, eh. For one of the old uh, fight nights on ESPN Plus from the Apex. What do you expect? How many fights are on this card? Hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, 11, 12, 13. Ugh. 12 is the sweet spot as a general rule, but full preview next week. All right, that's it for me. Thank you all very, very much as always. Appreciate it. Stay safe out there and continue to be well, be safe, and behave.